What's up, Craig? Hey, buddy. Heard your bag was talking shit about my uh, Rom the Frost mini campaign last week. It probably was. <laughs> I'll tell him I'll give him a draw for a stab to the face if I hear him t- talk shit again. Although, you have to remember, he was an ogre. Like, uh, Craig's bag of holding, as it were, was an ogre. So his shit-talking skills are probably not very good. Uh, Me watch stream. Stream doo-doo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's probably the equivalent of it. It's it's the boxer who's been hit in the head a few too many times and then tries to get on the microphone and shit talk and is just awful at it. <laughs> so we're the Grumpy Dungeon Masters. My name is Christopher. No, no, it isn't. It, it it's, is. It's Chris. It's Christopher. And, and I'm Jay. It's officially Christopher. The nickname is Chris. Okay, Chris. Whatever. See, well, see, the thing is, like, you can't, like, have people say, Hi, what's your name? It's Christopher. Oh, okay. Can I call you Chris? Like, yeah, sure. Who does sure. that? Who, do, who does but, that? But the name is Christopher. The name is Christopher. Yeah, you're, I'm sure on your birth certificate it's Christopher. And maybe your mom calls you that, but nobody is called Christopher. Unless My mother calls me Christopher only when I do something bad, which is like... Right. Yep. Um, but everything official that I sign, it's always Christopher. It's never Chris. I, I can't stand like writing Chris knowing when he was Christopher and like, but then again, when it, when I sign my signature, it's just Chris because I'm too lazy to write out the whole name. <laughs> it's too much. It's too long. See, I, at least with my signature, it's fucking three letters. Yeah. Real simple. Yeah. And you can just reduce it to one and it's still I could, same. Yeah. I, I could just put <laughs> just fucking initials and be done with it. My brother has the best initials. His name is Justin Arthur Waples, so it's Jaw. So he goes by Jaws sometimes. Huh. That's yeah. not too bad. No, it's not bad. It's pretty good. Yeah. All right. So what are we talking about today? Do you want to start off with my story? Or no. Start yeah. Off with your no, story. Let, let's let's. T- Man, this is the grumpy dungeon masters. Let's talk about motherfuckers who are grumpy and like to complain about shit when they have no reason to. All right, so here's the backstory. In our breadth of things that we have to kind of keep track of, there is a Facebook group that's basically people asking questions to other dungeon masters and kind of getting a general response. And we're on there a lot, and we leave a lot of comments, and we I, try to. I'm on there know, a lot learn. when I when I don't yeah. have a temporary two week band. But... Yeah, don't get banned next time. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, there's this guy who will remain nameless. I'm gonna call him. I'm gonna call him. Uh, let's call him Bob. Nick for short. Nick, Nick's, Nick's Nick. a good, Nick's a Nick's good a pretend one. nickname. Yep. Because it's a nickname. Yep. Get it? Uh, yeah, I see what you did there. All right. So Nick here, uh, uh, was kind of confused, a little bit upset, I guess, because he and his player had a big disagreement at the table. The disagreement was that his barbarian wanted to apply danger sense to a dexterity save that he that the DM was making him roll and the DM was adamantly no you can't have danger sense in this case because of XYZ reason. Now for those who, who don't know what danger sense is, it is a class feature class feature for the barbarian class. All barbarians get this right out of the gate. Alright if we are going to do this I'm going to just I'm going to read what Danger Sense says. That way That's what everyone I was knows. about to do. Okay, so, well, I've got it, so go ahead. At second level, you gain an uncanny sense of when things nearby aren't as they should be, giving you an edge when you dodge away from danger. You have advantage on dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see, such as traps and spells. To gain this benefit, you can't be blinded, deafened, or incapacitated. Now, in this scenario, the Barbarian was in a situation where he had to make a dexterity save, but the DM said, you didn't see this coming. But the barbarian wasn't blinded, wasn't deafened, wasn't incapacitated. And I think the problem this DM ran into is that he was too hung up on the phrase against effects that you can see. Because technically, you don't see a trap coming when the trap hits you. It just gets you. Danger sense for all intents and purposes in rules as intended 
the rule of cool, even raw, is anything that makes you give a deck save, you get danger sense to, unless you are blinded, deaf, and incapacitated. Then you don't get that benefit. Um, that being said, uh, he and this, the DM and his player had a huge disagreement about it, and this DM felt like he needed to air his grievance out on this Facebook forum <laughs> to kind of get more people behind him as to, you know, but, supporting his What's he going to do, show, show the fucking Facebook thread to his player and be like, look, these 632 other people say you're wrong. That was the plan, yes. It's one of the things he did mention that he was going to do. Like, that's such a dick move. It, it really is. See, all the time there are issues that pop up in Dungeons & Dragons when you're playing a game and you're kind of running things. And there are going to be times where you mess up and you have an issue unless unless like the rules are trying to make it harder for the players for narrative reasons you kind of just always kind of give the player the benefit of the doubt and let them have their core class abilities whenever the core class ability shows up so for whatever reason um this dm just couldn't accept that the player base out there was like yeah you really should have given him danger sense so that was the first day um, and there were a lot of people discussing it and they were kind of discussing like the extreme exceptions to that you know, ability. Like what, what does it mean? Things you can see, like, where's that line? And they were really trying to dive into the, uh, you know, nitpicking of the rules and the wording and the, and the usage. And, but overall the DM was kind of like not, he didn't have enough people behind him. So two days later, he created yet another thread with another, um, what's the word? Slightly, di I... slightly different topic. No, no, the same topic, but he gave the scenario a different spin. Oh, okay. He said, okay, my barbarian doesn't get danger sense in this case right here. And the case was he's in a building that, colla that is collapsing. And because it's collapsing above his head, he doesn't see it. So he can't dodge out of the way with a deck save. Except you're, no, gonna he's hear, still wrong. Except you're going to hear it. Like traps, yeah. traps are not always visual. If you're, you know, say you're standing, you step on a stone, the stone moves. That's a touch signal. You know, if you're picking a lock and you hear the wrong click, that's an audio signal. Like there are, I know it says very specifically, see but that is obviously not the intent. The intent is that you get some sort of a cue and you have that just brief instance to react. Like it's Spider-Man sense. And that's very much what it is. It is, it is Spidey sense. It's the Peter Tingle. That's exactly yeah, it's, it's what it the, is. It's the Peter Tingle. <laughs> it only works in these one cases when it's a dexterity save. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen all that often. And... Overall, you know, it's just give it to the player. Give him advantage. It's not that hard. It's a 5% chance at being better. That's it. There's so, there's many, no, pro yeah, like yeah. There's so many issues with this thing. First off, it's a barbarian. Okay. So the DM wants the barbarian to be hit by this trap. Yeah, I don't know the effects of it. You know, it's a dexterity save, so 99% chance it's just fucking damage coming through all right it's a barbarian it's fucking d12 of dice for hit points who knows what level but unless the dm is putting them against traps that are just fucking lethal he's just gonna survive it so rather than deal with it like adults and continue playing continue having a good time the DM decided to be such a dick and adamant about this that he could easily have just ruined his entire D&D &D game just to deal a little damage to a barbarian that's going to suck it up and just walk away from it. Yeah, we, I, don't, I don't know what this, this barbarian was, but more than likely it's probably a totem barbarian like they all are. So it's going to take like half damage to <laughs> the trap, you know? I mean, so, yeah, well, the, yeah, like... Barbarians are ridiculous. If they're totems, yeah, they're they're just taking n no damage. <laughs> right. 
And it's, it's the thing, it's, it's just advantage. It's a core feature, it's advantage. If it was a rogue, okay, he could have just nullified all the damage. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know? As long as he saw it, you know, the target was, you know, trap was just hitting him. It wasn't like an AOE or something. You know, you can nullify it. Are you going to take that away from the rogue in this case? I mean, it you operates know? under almost the same effects. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it, it, it's okay to get hung up on some of the wordings. You, you were the DM. You have to make the make the call. Me and you disagree on um, Tiny Hut and how Tiny Hut works in a very particular location of Frost Maiden. And right. it's up to the DM to kind of make that choice and go, yeah, I think it applies this way because I don't think it will have those effects. And um, because the verbiage says something. And uh, yeah, like because the. Because the verbiage says that, you know, they stay nice and warm, so you don't think the effects of that region will hit it, where I'm like, well, these are layer effects, and those kind of go past that. Effect. See, this, so, is, this is actually on par with the, the DM issue that we're already talking about, though. Give it to the players. Right. So the re- only reason why I didn't in this particular case was because it was a layer action. And given the location that it is, it's supposed to be harder on them. Not something that's supposed to be defeated by an easy spell. Did I give them benefit? I mean, there's two other things that the layer actions, layer actions, layer effects have that the tiny hut uh, negated. You know, like yeah. the having to make a save for taking a rest. You know, that that was negated. I didn't I didn't make them do that. Because yeah, you, you, you didn't give them the full effect. You just decided right. to give them some benefits from it. Correct. Uh, which, which is, I mean, that's that's definitely better than giving them nothing for it. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a spell. They need to get something from it. So I gave them, okay, you're not going to have to make me cold saves. Because if you yeah. just had basic gear, you're going to have to be making those saves. But, you know, the fact that they had the tiny hut... And that they've even found previous shelter to, to put it into, you know, they got some effect. But the other effect, I feel, is more of a uh, presence. Like it's more of it's not really yeah. a weather specific thing. It's more just like here is a daunting presence that is just See, suppressing these abilities. Yeah. When, but that's when just how to, I read it. When it comes to finagling of wording, I am if it's if it's not very clear like not super specific as to the intent, as to the wording, I'm always going to side on the side of the players. Right. Yeah. Because as a DM, I can, I, I mean, I've got 8 million other tools to kill their characters if I want. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you come into a situation where somebody t- tosses a wording at you and then you read it and you're like, no, this is exactly how it works. This is the intent. It's fucking obvious like danger sense you know but sometimes it's ambiguous and you have to at that point i i I want to rule with the players most of the time a lot of times sage advice has already answered the question as well too yeah of which i disagree with a lot of them but yes (laughs) 90 percent of them yeah. yeah and with tiny hut it was it was essentially um dragon's breath penetrating tiny hut and it does according to them it's not a protective barrier bubble. It's just no, it, yeah. here's it, a warm it, place. It does say spells. Spells cannot pass through, right. if I recall correctly. But Dragon's Breath is not a fucking spell. That, that's a that's flame. That is a fuck you mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this story with the Barbarian in Danger Sense doesn't end after the second day in the second post. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. Two more days go by, and the same DM posts again to the same form. And the opening line is to the effect of, Seems I sparked a pretty good debate, so hive mind, cast your vote. Here's what Danger Sense means. Here's the scenario with the house falling on top of them. Does the barbarian get Danger Sense? Um, and for ease, I'll say it's daytime, and the debris is, you know, falling everywhere. Does he get it? And his response is no, because the, the barbarian cannot see the house falling on top of him. So, currently right now, the poll is still open. Um, 716 people have voted. Can you guess how many people voted that the Barbarian does get Danger Sense? 99%. 99%. 
99 no, percent number <laughs> oh uh well how many were how many people were voting how many have voted 716 so 715 <laughs> Not not that good. Seven hundred and three people say that he does get danger sense, and, and thirteen people says that he does not. He was so sure that people were going to side with him, or was going to be dead even. <laughs> like he was even fighting back against it. He's like, I mean, that's... The, the, the poll has been up for only a day. It, it can definitely swing at any time. It was already like two hundred and fifty to one. <laughs> like, no, buddy. No. Like, sometimes sometimes you're wrong. Yeah. And now life. That... As a DM, sometimes you're just wrong. Yeah, what is it? What you... is it? Is that is that ninety eight percent? I think that's like ninety eight percent that disagreed with him. That's fucking oh. overwhelming. It is ninety eight point two percent. Yeah, like give it up, buddy. You're wrong. You're so <laughs> wrong. You're so wrong. You should be ashamed. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna kick the guy while he's down. Yeah, I will. But just, <laughs> I will. It just sometimes you're just gonna be wrong in life. It, it's going to happen. You can't be perfect all the time. Expect to be wrong, but fucking straight up admit it when you're wrong. You know, you, you just you don't even have to admit it. You just have to accept it. Accept that. Okay, I'm. I guess I'm entirely wrong in this scenario, and I will change the way forward you got to learn from your mistakes and just move forward yeah. not just in dungeons and dragons and playing a dm just in life in general yeah grumpy life that, tips now all of this being said he is still the dm of his own game if yes. he if he does not want to allow danger sense that is absolutely his prerogative he's wrong in doing so but you know if if he and his players agreed which they obviously don't, but if he could get them to agree about the wording and how Danger Sense works, then all right, you know, he could alter it. Uh, in this case, I don't think it's worked out that way, and he, you know, he's definitely caused strife at his own table. Yeah. And, like, I can think of the past couple of games that I've done where I've made some very big errors. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, one of the players pick somebody up, Okay, as a bonus action healing spell, and then as a reaction, pull them out of the square and put them into another square. And I did a reaction op attack on that, and I let the player who did the movement choose whether he takes it or the person he just healed takes it. And you know, my rules lawyer, who who's you know helps me out a lot to catch things when I'm kind of all flustered from a thousand sides, he's like, that doesn't doesn't. You know that kind of movement wouldn't want to provoke the op. Uh, I don't even know if you can even make that kind of movement with an action, but I let it go. I was just, just, it's like, just. just I mean, let that's happen. That yeah. one's ambiguous. It's outside of the the general rules of the game because there's nothing <laughs> about dragging individuals in the rules that I know of. Uh, that being said, if the if the player was dragging somebody and the player was within five feet of an attacker, obviously that's a reaction attack. Well, neither the only the person that got moved was the person that was dragged. The other guy stood it was in the same spot. Oh, okay. And I kind of, yeah. I kind of, I kind of saw it as he's bending down, grabbing the guy, and then moving them one space to another. While he's not the one moving, he's still provoking that opportunity attack by moving somebody else. Yeah, I, I definitely, so, do, I don't feel you're wrong by allowing an opportunity attack there. It is I, ambiguous, I, and that's sort of a DM discretion thing. Yeah, so I kind of I had to go to to the player, let him choose, and he chose to take the hit. Um, but force movement does not provoke opportunity attacks. And the, the the best part was the player. He's like, you know, things are getting really tight when I'm coming through and rules lowering these things down to the details to save us. Uh, I mean, that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and as I've always, as I've just recently said, like ten minutes ago, I don't want to go back on my own words. I, I'm always they're gonna try to side on the favor of the players. So it is yeah. an ambiguous rule. So, so the story doesn't end there. <laughs> oh, of, of course it doesn't. No, I know. Yeah, just keep going. So, the following day, somebody else posts, "Man, that DM sure didn't want to give his player danger sense, didn't he?" <laughs> <laughs> and just, just oh. kicking this guy when he's down is just. Look, I sometimes felt you fucking deserve it, man. 
I, I feel real bad for him because like, obviously he read, read it one way, you know, hopefully now he understands like, you know, be nicer to the player. Let the player have his core's ability. Okay. Let hold, him do what he wants to do. I don't feel bad for him. All right. When he first posted this thing, the first time it was very obvious he was wrong. Then he posted it the second time, and it was obvious he was wrong. <laughs> and he just, and then two days later, he does it a third time with a fucking poll that comes out at ninety eight percent against him. At that point, the guy's being an idiot, you know. And he deserves to get a little, you know. Obviously, you don't, you know, you don't fuck with the dude too badly, but a little bit of good trolling at him is deserved. Like, you've done fucked up enough three times. So, I mean, there there are more important things that can be debated to the you know end of time in the D&D sense. Yeah, you know. uh, yeah like, are rogues good or, uh, you know, how broke? Yeah. Or, or, you know, how busted is the, uh, you know, paladin smite? Yeah, these are things that can be debated forever. Dangerous Why sense. does everybody sense take two levels of two levels of fighter? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah. How good is Action Surge? You know, Action Surge was broke as fuck in third edition. I don't know about fourth edition, but it's it's still broke in fifth edition. Like just take another turn. That seems really fucking good to me. I think everybody had an action surge in fourth edition. Yeah, I never played it, but I'll I'll take your word for it. I know third edition, yeah, people would pick that feat up that aren't fighters. Uh, it was designed as a fighter style feat, but any class could get it as long as you met the prerequisites for it. And I, if I recall right, the prerequisite, I, I think they called it heroic surge, but it was the same effects. You could take another action. You could make, you could take another attack action. Yeah. Another attack or move action, which is pretty baller. And if I recall right, there was no limitation on how many times you could do it per turn. So if you had heroic surge, like if you had taken the feat multiple times, Hang on, I'm trying to recall. No, you got it at fourth level, and then every four levels you got another effect of it. So you could, you know, if you're hit like 20th level, you could heroic surge four or five times in a round. Yeah. Which is just fucking stupid. Yeah, it seems like I I I, I played a lot of D and D. I've DM'd a lot of stuff, and I I seem to. Nothing, nothing I do seems to go past like little tennis. Mm-hmm. So I've never had to deal with like the. That's constant, because you only. Like, that's because you only run campaigns that are already pre-made. Yeah, maybe. No, well, t- they they tend to stop at twelfth level. So. So yeah, I've never had to deal with like the level eighteen, <laughs> paladin rogue fighter build that does insane amount of damage. So. Well, in fifth edition, there's a few builds that you don't have to be any higher than 10th to do insane amounts of damage as I've, as I've talked about recently, you know, hashtag, I've never hashtag played... gloom stalkers. <laughs> I've never played the, uh, great weapon fight, the great weapon, uh, barbarian. I really want to one day. I want to play that, that trope. <laughs> Oddly enough, that's not even that egregious because of it's, it's really good in certain situations, but things with high ACs, it's absolute garbage against. Uh, you know, it can do some damage for sure, but it's not, you, you're going to miss a lot of attacks, so it kind of balances itself out. Now, if you're fighting something that it has a you know, butt ton of hit points and really low armor class, it's really, really good against that. Yeah. Artificers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, I've heard a lot of people complain about artificers. I haven't run across enough of it, just because I... I don't really, I don't play artificers, and most of my players don't really play artificers. So the, the very little bit I've seen, it was, it didn't seem that bad to me. But I'm sure there's some broke stuff about it. I think, I think if you want to max a class to its broken status, it's, it, oh, there's always an option. You know. Most, yeah, most classes I think could be. Like I know, fighters definitely have a couple of builds. Rogues have a couple of builds. Paladins have a couple of builds. Although I will say, it seems to almost completely be the melee classes that get that, or the or the archers, like the fighter style of classes. The spellcasters, 
uh, other than maybe druids, not particularly broken. Well, I mean, fireball. Fireball's not particularly broken, though. It's, it's really intentionally broken. It, I still don't. It, I think at fifth level it's broken, and then by seventh level it's not broken anymore. Damn it, Craig! Why you gotta fuck up on us all the time? Uh, I wanted to kind of. I've been digging around through the DMG because there's a lot of stuff in the Dungeon Master's Guide that we don't ever really specifically talk about. I kind of wanted to go over the flavors of fantasy. Is what what they talk about it's on page 38 and they sort of break they sort of break down the different styles of fantasy campaigns uh for dungeons and dragons or it's, and it's not even i guess it is all D D, but you could run any system with this as, so as we real, know yeah real quick before we get too deep into this i have to ask have you actually read a dungeon master guide cover to cover oh yeah god yeah Okay, I never have. <laughs> <laughs> I have never read a DNG cover to cover. It was actually one of the uh, New Year's resolutions that I had to myself, and I wanted to bring it up earlier on a, an earlier podcast. Um, completely forgot to, but it's, I actually want to read through the Five E Dungeon Master Guide, like you know, yeah. cover to cover. Never have. So second ed- probably should. Second edition when it came out, you know, I'm 15 years old. Like uh, I was so immersed into D and I have read every single book I had. I was able to get my hands on a uh, cover to cover multiple times. Third edition, I read the DMG cover to cover at least you know, once. The fifth edition, one, I've I've flipped through it. I've read a lot of it, but yeah, I definitely I haven't memorized it like I did earlier editions. All right. So on page thirty-eight, what yeah. section? What what what's the title of that? It's section? flavor flavors of fantasy, and it's just sort of detailing out the different styles of fantasy settings for for D and D, and a lot of them. I mean, honestly, I've played most of this style, at least some, with a couple of them that I have not. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, okay, so it, it starts off with the heroic fantasy setting, and this is the one that we're all familiar with. This is your Lord of the Rings. This is your uh, Forgotten Realms, uh, uh, okay. Greyhawk. Like, it, it's it's your generic fantasy settings. Although, I have to say, at least with Forgotten Realms, there's some shit that I don't necessarily think really fits with fantasy setting. Uh, like, Artificers. Uh, Artificers is actually a perfectly good example I know I've talked about this briefly, but there was nothing like that in earlier editions of D&D. Uh, like, that's a, that's some shit that came over from World of Warcraft. Craft. <laughs> I can't uh, tell like, if those a Freudian slip or not. Yeah, exactly. Definitely was not intentional. Definitely. So, yeah, like the, the gnomes, they, they didn't... They had tinkering, but it was like tinkering with jewels and stuff it wasn't it was more david the gnome and much less world of warcraft gnomes let's build entire railroad systems and shit like that that was not a thing and forgotten realms for the forgotten realms for the most part avoids that but it still has airships and i know if you go to hell they have like hell powered war machines and stuff yeah so i was about to say is like current forgotten realms lore you have the the flying cities but those are actually far past technology yeah that's um, that's old right it's old tech the future tech is the old tech just like star wars yeah. um then you have the artificers and all their magic tinkering stuff you have mechs okay yep which was um, never a thing that that i think's fucking you know eberron sort of well i mean there's that. there's the eberron mechs and then there's the clockwork tech yeah. that they have because like even in Waterdeep, you get a um um a submarine that's got like claws and stuff on it. Oh, geez. Uh, really? I didn't even know yeah. that. And then you have the, you know, the walking statues of water deep and stuff like that, but those are really animated statues more than anything else. And then, like you mentioned, if, if you go to Avernus, yeah, you got Mad Max style <laughs> war machines. Like, yeah. It's fueled by souls. <laughs> and uh, may, maybe it's just me. I, I, if I'm playing fantasy, man, I want fucking, f- I, I want old school fantasy. You know, I want Lord of the Rings. I, I don't particularly want this. You know, I don't want World of Warcraft, to be honest. 
but I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of torn because on one side, one hand, like I, I like the old school, let's just call it Lord of the Rings fantasy, where yeah. there's no science at all. Yeah, that yeah, her, heroic fantasy. <laughs> right. So there's there's no science at all. Everything is spells and magic based. Um, you may have an inventor here or there, but you know the biggest thing they have is gunpowder. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, but then like there are a couple like uh, a couple uh, Magic the Gathering uh, planescapes that are really interesting from a fantasy perspective, but they're high in technology. Like uh, was yeah. it Kaladesh? Yeah, Kaladesh is high tech. As yeah, it were. but that, utilizing that, magic with it. That setting is amazing looking. Yeah, you know, like it, it's it, it's you know future you know, um, I can't remember the word. Uh, it's future perfect like tech running around doing stuff. It's it's mm-hmm. really really cool. But it, yeah yeah I don't want that in Forgotten Realms. Yeah, Forgotten Realms to me should not have any of that. Forgotten Realms is your basic setting. It needs to be. I, I hate to say the word pure, but that's kind of the, the example. Like, it needs to be your Lord of the Rings setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so moving on. Then there's the sword and sorcery. And Dark Sun actually, I would say, falls under sword and sorcery. But it's Conan. your... It, yeah, it, exactly. Yes, it is your Conan setting. It's your Robert E. Howard settings. You know, it's it's low magic. And mind you... Dark Sun wasn't necessarily low magic per se, but it wasn't really high magic either. Uh, but it's, yeah, armor is, yeah, it, it's leather armor. You're, you're not going to find a lot of people running around in plate mail. There's not any knights. There's nothing like that. You know, barbarians, rogues, fighters, these are the vast majority of what you're going to see in those settings. Uh, mm-hmm. With the, you know, with the occasional wizard. Just go back and watch the original Conan film, and that's that's going to give you a perfect example of what a sword and sorcery setting should be. Come uh, here, child. Come here. Nah. <laughs> You've seen the original Conan, right? Yeah. Okay. Lord, I'd hope so. We'd have to stop this podcast, and you have to go watch it otherwise. I've seen Conan. I've seen all the Conans. Okay. All three of them. Yeah. Sadly, there's only the three, and the, the, the last one is all right, but it's it's not what I wanted. I keep hearing rumors they're going to do King Conan someday with Arnold back on the throne, but when he needs money, he will. He doesn't need money. That guy's got yeah, so that's much. That's why money. he hasn't done it yet. When he needs <laughs> money, he'll do it. <laughs> we can always hope, though. Um, yeah. The next one up in the list is the epic fantasy, and this is epic fantasy is a little harder to describe, but I. I think epic fantasy is your that's your Dragonlance setting. Uh, and I'll just read. This would be your it. Star Wars Dragonlance. Yeah, I'm just going to read a little excerpt from the book. An epic fantasy campaign emphasizes the conflict between good and evil as a prominent element of the game, with the adventurers more or less squarely on the side of good. These characters are heroes in the best sense, driven by higher purpose than selfish gain or ambition, and facing incredible dangers without blinking. Uh, I, I do feel that Dragonlance has always sort of been that setting, but truthfully, I, from that description, any setting could be that if the DM wanted to make it that. Like even mm-hmm. Forgotten Realms could. If you if you guys are going to play the paladins, the the fucking good guys who are trying to actually right the wrongs of the world, you could turn it into an epic fantasy campaign. Well, I, I think I think when it, I think I think what they're trying to say for mythic fantasy. And well, kind of ep- we're, we're we're on we're on epic fantasy, not mythic. We haven't got there yet. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> you're, Never you're too mind far me. ahead. I'm too far ahead. Yep. All right. Uh, on mythic fantasy. Yeah, you you can talk about the <laughs> mythic fantasy. Go for it. <laughs> no, it's your turn. Uh, mythic fantasy is your that's your Greek fantasy. It's the easiest way to describe it. It's it's your you know, where your deities are taking uh, constant action within the world your characters could be demigods or or something of that nature and they are literally trying to perform epic and amazing feats uh, you know uh, clash of the titans and mind you the greek setting is the obvious one but there's a lot of other ones you could have you know vikings uh, hell you could you could do pretty much any setting if you just made it of that style 
I, th I think the key to it is you don't have a lot of fantastical monsters. You just have a fantastical monster. Yeah, so, like, maybe maybe a couple, but it needs to be minimal. Yeah. Well, it's it's in all how how you present them. This is what I'm getting from the, from the sentence about the Minotaur, where mm -hmm. it's it's not just like you have Minotaur via the stat block of five E, and there's six on the field, and you're gonna have six to seven encounters that are gonna involve Minotaur. There is only a single Minotaur the entire yeah. time, and it's just yeah. There there's the one Minotaur, Minotaur in the whole world. It's yeah. the Minotaur. <laughs> Yeah, I I like that a lot. Like I like having a lot of trash monsters. Like I like having goblins as a constant like universal threat. I like undead as a universal threat. Um, but then I like to have individual monsters that are just like here's this legendary bear over here that's like the god bear, <laughs> the dire yeah, bear. Yeah, it's the yeah, dire absolutely. bear. Absolutely. And the sword and sorcery style campaign would actually be somewhat similar. Like Conan didn't, there there weren't a lot of fantastical beasts in the yeah. Conan books, in the the movies. Like it, it was very minimal. You know, in the one movie, he killed the giant snake, but that hell, that was pretty much it. Well, he killed the giant snake. He killed the abomination thing that the 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 elder god it wasn't an actual elder god yeah 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 it's a demigod or elder god yeah. or whatever he, he killed the Cthulian god he just Conan's all about just how I can punch a sorcerer or to death <laughs> the movie that's the title of the I... podcast how to punch a sorcerer to death the movie <laughs> yep that's that's definitely yeah. the name of this podcast oh my god all right, we're moving on. There's the dark fantasy, and we we are all familiar with this one. Strahd, uh, we talked about Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft or some such last week. Uh, but yeah, your dark fantasy. It's your horror theme settings: werewolves, vampires, zombies, lots of undead. Uh, hell, I just got finished playing in a dark fantasy campaign, The Maw. It was all undead all the time. Yeah. I like undead. It's good. It's I like undead too because undead and like it's a simple narrative for bad guys. You know, undead are bad guys. If you're living in a world surrounded by undead and you're not undead, they're the bad guys. You know, you could flip that on its head now that I think about I, it. Though I did, I did have a homebrew, one of my very few homebrew sessions where necromancy wasn't bad. In a sense, like Rogue Undead still existed. It was just like Undead without a, you know, controller essentially. Yeah. But the the concept was is that, um, of, of like the five gods that existed, one of them was the god of Undead, and it was considered to be, um, an honor for a knight or a paladin to when they die to be resurrected back, to continue their service as an undead creature for the church, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, a lot of people would do that. So a lot of families, especially the richer families would do have more fancier, uh, raising the dead ceremonies to kind of bring their family back to always just like be in the house, you know, right. To, to make sure the lineage didn't die. And the poor families would basically resurrect their families so they could always have people tending the farms and just an ever growing farm, farm hand, like usage like here's grandpa still still picking grapes off the vine for the wine making for the family so i kind of had that as a concept i really liked that idea you know it wasn't very dark it wasn't like a main sense but it was still an interesting spin on yeah on it that, still it still touches on sort of the dark fantasy uh campaign although i i, I don't know that the entirety of a campaign campaign was set that way but it could if you're building a dark fantasy world to run a campaign you could absolutely add that as an aspect of it mm -hmm. uh then there's the the intrigue campaign that they mentioned this one is the hardest one i think of all of these to run i have tried running it before and it's it's mm -hmm. basically it's politics it's uh and it could be in really and truly any setting but the overall goal of the campaign setting is to play the politics of the world uh you know say you're you, you 
Uh, second edition had the Birthright campaign. Are you familiar with it? Nope. All right. Well, Birthright, it had all these different political factions in the campaign. And the one time I played it, we all started out as lords of different factions. So, uh, you know, our group ended up banding together and we played the politics against all of these other political factions. Uh, I had a hell of a good time with it. But it's a lot less combat oriented and a lot more role play and political maneuvering. If you yeah. have the right, if you have the right dungeon master for it, it's amazing. If you have the wrong dungeon master for it, it's probably god awful. Yeah, I know I am not the right DM for it. I've I've tried running it before, and it's just it's just too much goddamn work. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of work. It, it sounds like it'd be a lot of work, like. I think in the Waterdeep campaign that I ran, there was a lot of stuff to do with the, the whatever the council that they have there, of the mass lords yeah, yeah. in Waterdeep. And there's a lot of, you know, like, hey, you know, if you're going to go to this party, you got to be prim and proper. You don't want to right. you know, fall ill of this person. The rumor is, is that they're a mass lord, you know? And yep. uh, actually, I think probably the Acquisitions Incorporated campaign setting probably has a lot to do with that. Just knowing the characters on there and, how they have it, acquisitions incorporated run. It's very political, but from a business politics kind of stand. While adding comic comical humor into it. Jim's magic missile. <laughs> yeah. I the, tell you what, they have a keg robot in that book. All it does is like shoot beer. <laughs> like you wind it up, it, it walks around, it shoots beer at people and then sets the beer on fire. It is an amazing monster to use. I mean, that's pretty awesome yeah yeah i i enjoy acquisitions incorporated uh to me none of it is canon but i still enjoy it you can't get any more canon than having a book written for you <laughs> like we, we there have been some sly uh inserts some of the artists that i know uh have done where they've like you know in the background of this image that i have i have wanted posters for my camp you know characters in the campaign setting that i'm running yeah. So you could point to those things that people know and go, oh, look, there we are in this official source material. We're canon to the Star Wars world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you I, know? I know how. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that is a long stretch. But when you have a book written specifically for your campaign setting, you can't get much more canon than that. <laughs> uh, I, I feel that it's it is. It is not canon in the overall D and D sense, you know, because they're tying in their all, all their different worlds. To me, Acquisitions Incorporated, it it's official D and D stuff, but I'm not. I personally, I'm not allowing spells from it. I'm not allowing items from it. Not using monsters from it. I mean, Omen Drawn is used in other campaigns. Anyway, in video games. Anyway, moving on because we have a few more of these to get through. Uh, maybe that's our next game. Uh, that that's our next podcast is why why it's not canon or why it is canon. We, hell, we'll just do a whole ca- whole podcast on canon in general. All right. We'll have to remember that. We're probably both going to forget before next week. But anyway, I'm not writing it down. I'm not either. So <laughs> myst- mystery, uh, a mystery. Th- I'm going to read a little bit. A mystery theme campaign puts the characters in the role of investigators, perhaps traveling from town to town to crack tough cases the local authorities can't handle. Such a campaign emphasizes puzzles and problem solving in addition to combat prowess. This is your Call of Cthulhu campaign. This is what happens when you let your players be Scooby and the gang. Well, I mean, Call of, Call of Cthulhu is a little bit of dark fantasy and, and, and investigation. It, it, it's a yeah overlap of both, yes. Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, you're not really solving puzzles more than you're just trying to survive puzzles. <laughs> well, have you ever, I've actually played and run Call of Cthulhu. No, it's it's heavy on the mystery aspect of it. It's it, it, le- definitely, it definitely is. Um, I played uh, the Oriental Express. Okay, and, yeah, yeah. Um, that, was, that was entertaining. Um, I still disagree that putting a shotgun in a ghoul's mouth and pulling the trigger only does one damage. Oh, yeah, I remember this discussion. I agree with you. I agree. It should like, have killed the ghoul, or at least really hurt it. Like, okay, if I shoot it with a pistol, it does one damage because it's a ghoul. Get it. 
the shotgun. The shotgun's got to do it's, it's a, like a hundred pellets or a thousand pellets or whatever the fuck it is. Each one of those things has got to do a quarter of a damage, you know, or something. Yep. Okay, and that's not even my situation. It was in its mouth. The head explodes. It's a shotgun right. blast. I think we, we, we have we have definitely discussed this on the podcast before. I don't care. I'm talking about it again. <laughs> I'm still angry at it. How many years ago was this? Like three or four. Oh, okay. I thought it was like a decade ago. That's not too bad. Three or four. No. I, I, could, I could still be in cranky about that. Sure. I, I am so, I'm still cranky about it. I'm more cranky about how it ended than more anything else. Yeah. But, uh, but my, mystery campaigns, I've like the intrigue campaign. That's one that also requires a lot of setup, and there's a lot of ways a mystery campaign can go wrong. Uh, you're you're trying to solve clues and puzzles, and if you're not able to piece shit together, like the DM can back himself into a corner pretty easily. Uh, then you have to yeah. start hitting people with the clue by four. I think I could run like knives out the campaign setting or clue the campaign setting. I'd fucking play knives never... out the campaign setting. I mean, I'm, but I could never, I could never write that. I, I just know my limitations on, on things. I can only have so many twists, you know, yeah. before. You yeah. Know. Yeah. And for all you motherfuckers who have not watched knives out, go, go watch it after, after you finish listening to the podcast. It's really good. Really good. <laughs> Um, so the swashbuckling campaign. Uh, this one's pretty obvious. You're pirates or some such. Maybe you hunt down pirates. I mean, yeah, this is almost more of an era thing than it is anything else. This is this is pirate. This is low gun, a low gun campaign setting. Yeah. So muskets and you know any kind of like gunpowder style guns well you can i mean yeah but you can still intersperse this with magic for sure uh like i was playing at a swashbuckling campaign before covid hit and the only reason it's on hiatus is because we haven't wanted to pick it up on roll 20 we'd like rather do it in person but yeah like it's you know you've got wizards with spells on a ship and ship to ship (laughs) combat gets real interesting so i love how in every single one of these like flares of fantasy it says a good example of this is blah 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 in forgotten realms <laughs> forgotten realms can't be an example for every single one here okay see most of these are correct when it comes to forgotten realms like second edition or even third edition forgotten realms now forgotten realms consist of the sword coast which does not have all of these flavors of fantasy in it well, that's fair but it definitely has swashbuckling that's for sure yeah, you would definitely find swashbuckling. You could find the intrigue up there. Uh, you would, yeah, and heroic fantasy. I wouldn't go beyond that with. I not, I not dropped that area. two blunderbusses in my Icewind Dale campaign setting, uh, <laughs> and I was just waiting for one of the players to go. That's a blunderbuss. I need to get it. <laughs> and of course they didn't. No, they didn't. They got lost in the ocean forever. That's fine. If you if you play your cards right, you can just get laser pistols instead. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, all right, there's two more. There's the war campaign, and this one, this is the one that I, if we ever ran it or somebody runs it using Bruce's method uh, that we had on. If you guys haven't listened to the episode, the Bruce Burkhart episode, buddy of ours, because uh, he came up with a really good system for doing mass combat. You would need to use something like that. But, you know, setting the characters up as, say, generals or even uh, a military unit would be kind of an interesting thing. You know, they have to follow their orders. Maybe they find out their guys are really the bad guys. You know, there's a lot of twists and turns you could have with a war-style campaign. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on it? No. No? Nope. Because, uh... I mean, at a certain at a certain point in time, you can have a war campaign where you're focused on war, but the moment you start bringing in like troops and troop movements and stuff like that, um, which is what I think you would need for a war campaign, I don't know if Five E has any of those rules. Well, that's what I was saying. Bruce had come up with yeah. the methods of doing that. So, I mean, beyond just you know pulling out Warhammer. Oh, oh just, no, no, God, play, no, don't Playing don't a game of Warhammer. <laughs> no, nope. That, that's what well, earlier like, D&D games were. We'll pass on that. 
but you know, that, that's that's kind of interesting. I mean, it's something I actually kind of did. Um, like, if you are having a war campaign and you're you're setting up this big epic battle where the forces are all going to clash on a field, you know, and you have and you have uh, Warhammer miniatures and you have let's say an army of go- orcs and versus a couple armies of humans. Just play a game of Warhammer to, to kind of get that all sorted out. Just one That's session, everyone rolls up to the rolls up to the table instead of pulling out the character sheets. You're like, nope, here's a Warhammer book. We're gonna play this tonight. Uh, I did solve that way. I mentioned Birthright just a little bit ago, but Birthright is actually designed. Mind you, it's second edition, but it was actually designed as a war campaign. So it mm-hmm. came with it came with cards with troops on it. Uh, they, it would have battle maps, and you could actually maneuver troops and play out a sort of secondary game within the D&D game. Hmm. Yep. I'm surprised they haven't ever tried to bring that back or some variant of it uh, in an official capacity. Yeah. The other idea, is too, is just boot up, like, Total to, uh, total War Rome or something like that and just, like, have <laughs> and- it simulate the, the, the match and see what happens. Yeah, there's a lot of randomization in that though. Like players could, you know, players need to be able to interact and make choices. Well, then uh, just play a real game of War, Warhammer online. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, just play a game of Risk. There you go. I hated Risk. Anyway, the last one is the Wu Sha campaign, and this is the one I'm. We're we're getting ready to start playing this one here soon, but it's your uh, Oriental Adventures. Like they had the third edition. Oriental Adventures first edition had one. I don't know if they've done one for fourth edition, but uh, there's a book out. It's not an official, but it was like on the DMs Guild Oriental Adventures for fifth edition. And the idea is it's your kung fu movies or you're playing samurai style characters. It's very Asian themed, and I I can't wait. I am so looking forward to playing these. I'm going to be playing a uh, Phoenix Clan Kensai in the game. What is that? Uh, it's a Swordmaster, basically. Uh, the, sword yeah, and the Kensai in the Oriental Campaigns, uh, it's different than the Kensai from Xanathar's. I think it was in Xanathar's. But yeah, it's, you learn how to use a sword really well. It's the only thing you really do. And being that I'm Phoenix Clan, the Phoenix Clan are primarily spellcasters, but well, fuck it. I'm using a sword, so. I'm going to put spells on my sword. Yep. Well, I actually built the character to be an anti-spellcaster. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you just take off the sp- We just discussed this, actually. How to punch sorcerers in the movie. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you punch them with a sharp, pointy sword. <laughs> uh, managed to choke him up on that one. I kind of was, yeah. Because I, I was kind of envisioning Arnold Schwarzenegger just jumping up on uh, James Earl Jones and just going, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> like giving him, give him the people's elbow from like top of statue. Oh, God. Yeah, that's how you beat up a sorcerer. You just let the barbarian grapple them. <laughs> Boy. Like, like having the rock get a hold of some little nerdy kid and just choking him out. <laughs> All right. I think that's enough for this week. Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Thanks yep. for listening. Bye, Craig. Quit doing a shitty job, Craig. All right. Bye, guys. Biggity bam. We're out. Stop it with the taglines. <laughs> hey, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Check us out on Facebook at... There's no at in Facebook. It's just facebook.com forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters. And on Twitter... Uh, that'd be at grumpy underscore DMs and on Instagram at grumpy dungeon masters. And also be sure to follow us on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash grumpy dungeon masters, where we play Rhyme of the frost maiden every Saturday at 8 PM Eastern standard time. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs>